In 1974, you began to see young people walking along with a copy of a book about motorcycles and Zen Buddhism. The concept was mysterious. So was the writer, Robert Persig. There wasn't even a picture on the book jacket. Originally, I did send in a picture for Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and uh, the editor says it, it's out of focus and it doesn't look anything like you, but we'll print it anyway if you want. And I said, well, all right, we'll get another one. But then he said, wait, I've got an idea. Let's make you a mystery man. And uh, so I said, that's fine with me. Robert Persig's manuscript had been sent back and forth from Montana to New York, Chicago. 121 publishers said no. A book about motorcycles and philosophy was probably too confusing. The William Morrow Company took a chance and paid Persig a $3,000 advance. The book is an examination of values, a search for quality. It offered an answer to those confused by the 60s. Persig said the whole culture happened to be looking for exactly what this book has to offer. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance continues to sell 100,000 copies a year. Robert Persig lives near Boston, and he and his wife Wendy came to meet us for a conversation in the studio of WBUR. He brought his wife for support. Persig is reclusive, does not like meeting people. There's a new Persig book called Lila, an inquiry into morals. It's been an off and on bestseller for a couple of months now. Lila, although it involves a sailboat rather than a motorcycle, is definitely a sequel. The captain, or Phaedrus, meets a woman named Lila, has a brief affair. She becomes lost in madness, but the issue throughout is quality, and Persig defines the metaphysics of quality in the book's last paragraph. Good, he writes, is a noun rather than an adjective. Robert Persig has been working on this book for 15 years, sitting in a room, waiting for the words to come. It's been suggested that he revels in writer's block. Now, the idea of, of, um, of, of uh, reveling in, in uh, blocks is not exactly right. I get blocks whether I revel in them or not. But uh, my feeling is that when these blocks come, wouldn't, one shouldn't say, my God, I'm not writing. I'm blocked. I think when one is blocked, one in fact is writing, that uh, the blockage is a part of the writing, that if a person writes without any blockage, it means he's writing off the top of his head and is likely to write something that's rather quick and, and probably superficial. Full of cliches. That's right. Something, it's likely to be something he's heard and is passing on rather than something that, that he has put together himself. Are you, are you hearing or seeing words in your head that you're sort of pre-editing and discarding? Thoughts? What is happening is, is that uh, I'm just distracted by uh, memories that I've had the previous day. If, if somebody has talked to me over the telephone, then that will come back to me, and I'll think about that for That's 10 it. minutes. And All these memories will keep coming back and coming back until they, they gradually die down because I'm so bored with remembering them. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then at that point, I start to get fresh new thoughts. Yeah. Lila is set up in a, in a narrative novel form mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, fiction. Mm -hmm. you, you say that uh, what you do is you put your protagonist up a tree and throw rocks at him. and like Get him down again, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or send your protagonist on, on a mm -hmm. quest, and in this case a quest for um, the meaning of quality. Mm -hmm. But uh, So we have, we have two things going on, one of which is the narrative and the other mm -hmm. uh, sort of reflective essays on, mm -hmm. on quality. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend or do you mind if people say, well, it's going to take me a couple of times to go through this book, to understand what's going on, to begin to get into it? I wish they didn't, but I'm afraid that's, that's the case. You wish they, they didn't? I wish they would be able to read from first sentence to last and understand what I mean. That was certainly my intent as I wrote it. But I know from the mail I've been getting on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, that one of the most common openings is I have read this book seven times or 20 times or 30 times, and uh, I'm getting more out of it all the time, or I still don't know what you're talking about. And to some extent, the writing of Lila was, was uh, an answer to those letters. Mm -hmm. They said, I, uh, what are you really talking about? And I said, okay, I'll expand. Uh, some professional philosophers said, well, Persig has just given us a skeleton here in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. We want some more flesh and blood. Don't just give us this, this mystic term which nobody can define, the center of which is nowhere and the edges of which are, uh, can't be found. So in Lila, I'm saying, okay, here's something positive. 
Now, traditionally, when you do that, all you do is raise more questions. You never, you never answer any questions. Say, and and the interrogator says, "Well, okay, now I'm satisfied. That never happens." Uh, the the schools of philosophy have been founded that way, where the fellow says one statement, and the other fellow says, "What do you mean by that?" And of course, he says what he means. Then they say, "What do you mean by that?" And, they, and you go down into further and further expansions. So I'm afraid that's what's happened with Lila. See, when I feel that, that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is sort of a dynamic book in, the, in terms of the metaphysics which I've given there. It takes a great leap forward into areas that I've never heard talked about before. Lila is an attempt to nail that down. Well, you get very clear examples mm -hmm. from, from anthropology, a, mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of discussion about, mm -hmm. about American Indians, very clear examples from biology and other, mm -hmm. other sciences. Some parts, some of the parts I have difficulty, mm -hmm. more difficulty with, and, and mm -hmm. say to myself, in a quieter time, I'm going to go back and... Yeah, I'm afraid everybody's going to do that. I'm really hoping that, uh, that serious uh, uh, thinking people will really meet me halfway in this metaphysics of quality. And... Uh, see what I'm trying to say. Uh, I, I'm very disappointed that so few people are, are, are understanding. I really knocked myself out for 15 years trying to make this just as clear and interesting and, and uh, straightforward and understandable as I could. But it looks like I haven't made it all the way. Lila is a middle-aged woman who uh, comes from a river town along the Hudson and has had, had a, a real past. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wonder if you used sort of a rough character to give some sort of contrast to the, to the metaphysical discussion as we go along on this trip. Yes, originally I had, of course, all these ideas, and then it occurred to me that, uh, oh, Lila, I should say, is from Rochester, she's, which is a lake town. <laughs> it's just a technical point. But um, I felt that uh, what I needed was, as long as this is a book about morals, what I needed was a moral situation, a moral dilemma to uh, make it uh, work. Uh, I felt, as in the case, as was in the case of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle, maze, just the metaphysics by itself isn't going to carry this this book all the way through. People aren't going to read it. We need something to to mix it up with. To, to it's a, it's what you might call a case history. Lila is sort of a case history in morals. And of course, what could be more interesting? What moral issue is more interesting to people than sexual infidelity? And uh, that's sort of how Lila got born. And as time went on, uh, one of the great changes during the many years that this book is, is being written is a change in Lila's personality. When it started out, she was very friendly to feeders. She's a very nice person. But as time went on, she just got meaner and meaner. And Became more herself. More herself. That's exactly right. Lila says, and this is in dialogue, mm -hmm. that men want to, to have sex with women, I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. to, to destroy their center. Mm -hmm. But Lila knows she's she's wise enough, and she says they can't. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I know when I wrote it, it's one of those things that just uh, flew out of thin air, and it sat there on the page. And I said, I can't throw this away. I love that that line. It's it's very strong. It's the essence of Lila's character. I don't know of any woman who's ever said that to me. Uh, it's certainly not any feelings I have myself. I don't. I don't. It's not an occult uh, occurrence that those lines came, but somewhere I've it, it boiled up hmm. out of this this um, nothingness that uh, novels come from. Well, let's find it in the book and quote it accurately. Okay, let's where, see where it, is because it? Because it's nicely put. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have it marked. I think. Oh, is it? Okay, here we are. Mm -hmm. Was it um, a difficult decision to make f uh, as a writer to write in her voice? Very difficult. It, the decision was easy, but the execution was awful. Oh, I have spent as much as three days in almost solid meditation trying to get Lila to talk. She just won't talk sometimes. She just, I, I better not use the words Lila <laughs> tells me when I say talk, Lila. She, she won't do it. And uh, she, she just won't talk. And then after I'm quiet enough, I just wait her out. You see, and I just sit long enough, and then after a while, Lila opens up. Wow. Now, that passage you quoted was one of those periods after a long time of meditation where Lila suddenly, Lila suddenly became, <clears throat> let's see. Well, you've completely misunderstood what I'm asking these questions for, the captain said. No, I haven't. I completely understood it. Just exactly right, Lila said. All men do that. You're no big exception. Jerry did it. Every man does it. But you know something? It won't work. 
I'm not trying to destroy you, he said. That's what you think. You're just playing around the edges, aren't you? You can't go to the center of me. You don't know where the center of me is. That set him back. You're not a woman. You don't know. When men make love, they're really trying to destroy you. A woman's got to be real quiet inside because if she shows a man anything, they'll try to kill it. But they get all fooled because there's nothing to destroy but what's in their own mind. And so then they destroy that. And then they hate what's left and they call what's left Lila. And they hate Lila. But Lila isn't anybody. That's true. You don't believe it, but it's true. Women are very deep, Lila said, but men never see it. They're too selfish. They always want women to understand them. And that's all they ever care about. And that's why they always have to try to destroy them. Shall I go on? <laughs> There's some more here. No, I think that's, that's, that's far enough. Just, okay. Uh, did did mm -hmm. you, as the narrator, as the persona mm -hmm. there being responded to by Lila, feel badly about that particular revelation from her, that statement from her? Yeah, uh, it, was, it, it hurt, in a way, to hear her say that. I've noticed that, that uh, I did a little head count on reviews that have come in. I find that the men are more negative than women toward Lila. And I think that some of this, this negativism on Lila's part is really stinging men in places they don't want to be stung. And in the end, the, um, at the very center of this discussion of Lila is the mm -hmm. fact that she has, she has quality. Yes. The, now this is, yeah, uh, this is the koan of the book. Does Lila have quality? I'm sorry, you used a word I don't know. Is that right? Yes. That's a great old Zen term. Uh, koan is a, it originally means a case history, but it's a, it's a teaching device for Rinzai Zen, to some extent Soto Zen Buddhism. They give a student a koan, and he has to uh, work on it. Oh, K-O-A-N. Yeah, 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 okay. And he has to work on it. And uh, he comes up to an answer to the Zen master, and, and the Zen master says, no, I'll go back and work on it some more. So he goes and sits and works on it. And uh, he can spend maybe years on this one koan. But Lila is a kind of a koan. In fact, I reduced it to the famous Mu koan of, um, of Zen Buddhism. Does a dog have a Buddha nature? Uh, the, the famous Zen, ma Zen master Chao Chu, I believe it was, or Joshu in, 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 in Japanese, was asked, does a dog have a Buddha nature? And, and uh, his answer is mu, which means no thing, or literally, forget it. Just forget it. You're never going to get an answer to that question. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what I'm saying about Lila. Does she have a Buddha nature? The correct answer is forget it. You're never going to find out, and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and I think maybe some, some reviewers have gotten angry at the book for that reason, too, because I never tell. Does Lila have quality? I like Lila. I think she, she is absolutely true to herself, which yeah. is not true of most of us. That's right. And, and, in, and indeed has, mm -hmm. has many good qualities and is a quality person. That's mm -hmm. not what you're talking about, though. Well, uh, whether she has an ultimate quality or not, I tried to balance it, actually. She does some pretty bad things, uh, which, which I would not call quality. Uh, she, she has friends in New York, and she's telling come on the boat, maybe we'll get it away from him. Steal the boat. Yeah, that's bad. Have the boat run drugs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, so that's not quality by any social standard. I think at first, um, Phaedrus breaks it down, he says, uh, in beautiful way through this metaphysics of quality, saying biologically she does, socially she doesn't. But then later he comes back and he realizes that the question goes deeper than his simple answer. That there's this whole question of should Lila be allowed to violate social standards? She's a citizen of the world too. Could she go around chasing after other men's, uh, hu other women's husbands? Could she uh, uh, um, violate the code of, of, of morality which we've had with us for centuries and get away with it? The book seemed to indicate she isn't getting away with it, that some of her madness is a result of this promiscuous behavior on her part. It's left her without any social support. But beyond that, Lila, as, as is pointed out, is a dynamic quality that goes way beyond everything else. She's right at the front, as you say, she's true to herself. She's right at the front edge of her own experience. She's seeing the world right on. You know, she isn't filtering it through some, something somebody told her. She's seeing it just exactly as it is. And what she sees is just awful. And so she can't take it anymore. And she, go, and she invents a world in which these tensions don't occur. And then part three of the book starts up where Lila is insane. Do you feel comfortable now with the idea that you mm -hmm. are indeed a writer and you'll continue doing this sort of thing or, it, or have 
these uh, past, I guess, 20 years almost, been uh, mm -hmm. just sort of a chapter in your life that, that, you, that you'll remember and you'll go on to other things. What do you think? I think that the latter is, is probably what's going to happen. I think that uh, I've said what I want to say. Um, there are other things I could say, but it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it would be a lesser work than what I've done. I'd like to stop writing. This is my feeling right now. And uh, maybe just answer mail. And uh, if somebody has questions about the metaphysics of quality, uh, get into that. It may be, I hope, that, that people who are skilled in philosophy will take me seriously on this metaphysics of quality. The worst tragedy would be that everybody says either this is too hard or, or this fellow is just an amateur and we won't fool with him. I've heard both of those things said. And, uh, and, and they might drop what I'm saying, just the way um, Sidus was dropped. Uh, he haunts me. This uh, William James Sidus, who was the godson of the philosopher William James, who uh, had an IQ estimated around 300, who uh, graduated from Harvard at the age of 11 because they wouldn't let him graduate at the age of 8, who spoke five languages at the age of 5 and could translate Plato from the original Greek, said some things in a book and nobody read them. You see, nobody paid any attention to them because he's way too far ahead of where they were at. Now, I'm hoping it's, it's improper for me to say that I'm way too, hard, hard, or way too far ahead of any. I don't know that. But I think there's a possibility that, that uh, I may be dropped, you see. I may be ignored because I'm too hard to understand or because I'm thought of as some kind of a kook without being seriously considered. I've read a lot of negative reviews, but in none of those reviews have I seen one single critic show me where the metaphysics of quality is wrong. And I would like to give a prize to the first person who shows me that the metaphysics of quality is wrong. Call me any name you want, see, but show me that I'm wrong. And, and, and I don't think they can do it. Let's have a final um, mm -hmm. uh, question. Is there, it's a sailing question. Mm-hmm. Is there anything in writing or in philosophy that is as enjoyable as, as being on a beam reach on, a right, on the right kind of day when you had the right kind of breakfast and you're going to the right place? No, there's nothing <laughs> as enjoyable as in a good solid boat with uh, oh, there's just something about boats. I can't, it's a, it's a, a fever that gets into you. I sometimes compare it to malaria. My own boat's been out of the water while I've been finishing this book, but every time Wendy and I go down to the waterfront, all of a sudden I... Oh, I was just back two or three days ago at, uh, at a nearby marina, and I looked out the window, and there the boats were in the water, and Wendy and I looked at each other and said, uh-oh, <laughs> it's coming back again. And I have a feeling we'll be shipping out one of these days for Hong Kong or, or Australia or some distant port in our boat. That'll be a great life. Robert Persig, his new book is called Lila, an Inquiry into Morals.